Hey Claire, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing really well, thanks. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good too, thank you. Good, um, good. We're starting our films by asking contributors to introduce themselves. Uh, give them, oh. give, tell us your name and then let us know about your, your research profile in general, please. Okay, so uh, my name's Claire Warden. I am currently Senior Lecturer in English and Drama at Loughborough University. Um, and my research interests are kind of varied, I guess. So I am, I suppose by trade, a modernist. So I work on kind of early 20th century theatre and culture. Um, and, uh, but I also, I'm kind of interested in performance studies more generally. Uh, and that leads me to what most people want to talk more about, which is uh, my, my, my research work on professional wrestling. Great, thank you. Um, and you paused there, uh, tantalisingly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I'm, I'm keen to talk about, about that for sure, but I'm also keen to kind of link that to your wider yeah. profile, um, if that's okay. Yeah, um, which would you like to speak about first? Where would you like to go first? So maybe, we'll, maybe we start with the, with the theatre. So, um, yeah, so I, I started, I guess, as a theatre historian, mm -hmm. um, particularly interested in the early 20th century, and uh, I'm particularly interested in what I imagine to be a kind of lost, potentially lost experimental um, thread of work in Britain uh, mm. in the early 20th century. I read a lot of French plays and German plays and American plays and it was all like, oh, there's lots of interesting experimental stuff going on in here. What's happening in Britain? Um, is it, you know, is it just George Bernard Shaw, but he was Irish anyway? Like it's that sort, that was the sort of narrative. So that's where my PhD went and I thought about, um, the early, yeah, the early 20th century period, particularly theatre workshop, uh, early, early years theatre workshop and the plays of Ewan McCall. It was the first study of the plays of Ewan McCall. So I've always been interested in politics and art and that, how those two things go together. Um, and then from there, I kind of developed, that kind of developed a, a, a greater interest in modernism more generally and modernist culture more generally. So uh, rather than just think about theatre, I was interested in the way that um, theatre worked with other disciplines and fields and artistic approaches so um you know i've written a bit on kind of visual culture and theater and i'm interested in dance and i've written a bit on laban and things like that so um so yeah so so i i guess i i was a theater historian but kind of branched out into modernism more generally i i'm i'm I've always been a bit of a generalist ever since I was a kid and I think that probably just makes its way into my research work as well. Um, and then from there really became interested in, uh, in performance uh, kind of more generally and kind of in a contemporary sense on the stage. So um, how things are actually made on the stage and, and uh, what difference the conditions around uh, those performances might make to what's going on, on the stage. So a lot of my work on Russia comes out of this sort of feeling that um, I was interested in the kind of uh, how Russia made a how Russian theatre made a difference to British theatre in that early 20th century period, but in quite a kind of haptic touch real sort of a way. It's like, well, what difference did it make when this guy saw um, uh, the Russian director Meyerholt doing biomechanics, mm. like kind of those bodily movements? What difference that, did that actually make on the stage? So I became really interested in that and, and wrote a book about that. And, uh, and spent quite a lot of time actually thinking about about Russian culture um, and yeah so that's been kind of my theatre history background I guess to uh, to yeah to better. <laughs> yeah great thank you and if it's okay to link to one of our, our other films we made a film with um, the theatre broadcaster and academic John Wyver who um, yeah, I know John. Yeah, yeah. Uh, broadcasts um, for the Royal Shakespeare Company um, and one of his research projects is looking at very early TV. So he's talking to us about Georgian TV, which is a phrase which still completely blows my mind. So it's <laughs> yeah, I know. About just a little bit before that period or, or during um, and, and the theatre. Um, yeah. So I guess the obvious question then, if we're going to segue more towards wrestling, is how modernist is wrestling? And also, yeah. what, what are the biomechanics of wrestling? What is it about that kind of haptic, touch-based, bodily movement approach you were talking about in 20th century Russia? Um, yeah, are there ways of mapping those two research interests of yours onto each other? Definitely. So I think um, in terms of modernist wrestling, um, <laughs> I have actually written a paper on this recently, oh, which, wow. uh, which, yeah, which, which is my first attempt to bring it all together, which helps sort of claims uh, that early 1930s wrestling, kind of the origin point of, of British pro wrestling. It goes back before then, uh, but there, there's kind of a, a growth, I suppose, in, in wrestling in that 1930s period. 
and how that reflects some broader modernist narratives around things like fakery uh, and pretense and um, and anti theatricality, that sense of like, oh, you're so melodramatic, you know, those work when we use theatrical words to kind of slag off somebody's behavior. And that was a really um, big deal in um, in that modernist period. So, um, so yeah, so, so I think, I think that wrestling really reflects that modernist period in some really interesting ways. Um, and I think that the idea of the haptic, which is the other thing you mentioned there, um, so touch, I think is really important. And it's always been really important to me in my work, I think, when I think, when I sit down and actually think about how everything connects together. Um, you know, one of the things I wrote a lot about in the, in the Russian book was the difference that it made that two people shook hands uh, you know, that there is a sense of um, meeting, an actual sense of meeting, not just writing to each other, but actually meeting in person and the difference that makes to people's practice. Um, and for me, that is the kind of core of wrestling really is touch and uh, my ability to understand you through touch. So um, a, lot of, a lot of wrestling practice is done almost entirely through touch when I touch you in various I can read what you're trying to say and so I've always been really really interested in that and of course at this particular moment where we all exist kind of in slightly isolated uh, spaces I think the notion of touch is becoming even more important and resonant uh, in my own thinking right now as well. Yeah, thank you. Again, I'm sorry to keep making other links to, to films but Alison Bomber who is a voice coach has talked about how a lockdown is cutting us off from being in touch with each other's um, voice vibrations and the importance even when our bodies are not touching of things coming out of our bodies in the form of sound waves uh, and, and the need we have just for that kind of touch. Um, yeah, I love the idea of reading each other um, by touch. And you talked about handshaking, which feels um, kind of communal, but can also be weirdly competitive. I remember when Trump yeah. first became president, there were an awful lot of videos doing the rounds of how bizarrely and aggressively and unkindly and unfairly he shakes hands which it feels like an epitome of everything about that that terrible man um uh so yeah handshaking can be a form of greeting but can also be a form of contest i guess yes, yes. um and likewise yeah, and, and that would go for wrestling as well that actually it's that sense of like um there is a, a sense of community which maybe we can talk more about that sense of yeah. kind of collegiality in wrestling um but also a sense of competition, like that shouldn't be lost in our accusations of, oh, isn't this just pretending? No, actually there is like, there should be an element of competition, whether that competition is performed or not, it should feel like that. So there's a lot of really interesting kind of haptic uh, tensions and resonances going on in wrestling work, I think. Yeah, and I'm also thinking about different kinds of touching in that touching at the start of a wrestling match is consensual, but often one person ends up imposing their will on another person. So it also feels like it's playing with issues of, of non-consent and also perhaps yeah. issues of duration. So um, fast forms of touching, um, some wrestling holds are very long, some are about throwing someone around, so involve very kind of quick touching. I suppose there's all kinds of things you can do there around time as well as, 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 well as kinds of collaboration and contest. Oh yeah, no, totally. I think um, the, the, in a sense, wrestling is always about allowing your opponent to touch, if that makes sense. Like, so, um, even if it looks aggressive, so for example, someone throws a punch. Mm. Um, if you're performing a punch, bearing in mind this is not like boxing, if you're performing a punch, then um, you require the other person to then sell that punch and to take that punch. So even in the most aggressive of moves, um, there is a sense of kind of communal tactility i guess um that goes even more so for something like if i were to jump off a top rope which i don't do by the way but i see people do it all the time um and then then i would have to catch you like it looks like you're launching yourself at me and taking me out actually the truth behind that is far more collegial you jump off and as you jump off you have to trust i'm going to catch you and make it look like you're squashing me so there's something really interesting that is Touch is such a fascinating thing in the wrestling ring. It's something that I think about a lot, the way that it communicates, the way that it tells story, uh, the way that it um, says something about the characters and then the audience get, gets involved. And like, you know, at one point a wrestler could easily land on your lap and then suddenly you're in this kind of haptic yeah. world of the wrestler as well. And it's interesting what you said about like the resonance of the voices. That's one of the things that I'm missing from not being involved in wrestling at the moment is like, everyone like shouting and like and 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 chanting for the wrestlers and and that sense of kind of 
the, the communality of that sort of speech, I think, is something that I'm really missing at the moment. Yeah, and uh, you know, as a early modern theatre person and someone who's kind of bored of um, traditional forms of theatre now, um, wrestling feels much closer to me to a 16th century theatre performance scenario where it's vocal and loud and um, it's all about trying to get the audience to take sides. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's coming to Wrestling Resurgence back in March, which is the last thing, the last show I saw before lockdown, yeah. um, was really exciting um, for that reason. And I guess what you're showing us here is that touch, it, there's, there's kind of at least two narratives happening with touch. One is the narrative of two colleagues collaborating and the other narrative is of two opponents competing yeah. and the, the, right. the single moment of touch and the various single moments of touch all need are, are all in, they need to tell both of those stories at least for the people in the ring and also yeah. for anyone expert anyone who understands the world of wrestling um from the inside um they will mm -hmm. also be watching those two different stories at the same time i guess uh, totally so there's those, i think those two different types of touch work really interesting ways with each other in that if i am wrestling then i have to be understanding the touch of the other person and those can be quite subtle. It can be just a touch here, a touch here. Like they can be really, really subtle, but I had to learn that language in a sense. Um, the, the other version of touch here is that I, is the kind of, um, so, so Roland, I'm sure that some of your other wrestling uh, correspondents have mentioned Roland Bart, because uh, everyone talks about Roland Bart when we talk about wrestling. But <laughs> when Roland Bart talks about wrestling, he, um, he, he talks about it being like a spectacle. And, um, and that spectacle has to be excessive. It has to be obvious. So in a sense, you have this one level of touch, which is the two people working together in touch and the, re and the referee being involved in that as well. You know, these little tiny, tiny moments of touch, which sometimes are almost uh, impossible for a crowd to see. And then the big spectacular touch, the punch, the jumping off the top rope, these sorts of things, which have to be really excessive in order for the, for the audience to see it. So there's some, there's some really interesting kind of, um, Different, different layers or levels of touch going on in wrestling, I think. Yeah, thank you. It's also making me think about um, the, the wrestling I grew up with as a kid didn't really focus on the entrance to the ring, but I feel like that's become, or perhaps always was, and I just didn't see it, but it's, it's become a very big thing. And um, it feels like the, the audience's need to touch the wrestler as they come through the audience yeah. is also really interesting, the kind of high five um, moment. I mean, you particularly see that with kids, but it, it feels like there's a real need for some form of physical contacts there as a yeah, yeah. oh definitely and i think that wrestlers play with this all the time so so in resurgence which, you, which you've mentioned i should have said at the start that like i also kind of do, do a bit of commentary for wrestling resurgence which i enjoy very much um and, um, and one of the things that i uh remember quite early on uh, in a show is is jetta who is kind of one of the, the kind of heel baddie women on the british circuit an extra wrestler and her kind of going around and, and like pretending to high five people and this weak kid like puts, like puts his hand up to high five and she goes like oh no like and it's like this sense of like um of, of playing a heelish character by not touching um because like actually what they want is everyone to go around and high five each other and when you don't do that it it leads to booze it leads to know you're like you're not connecting with us like physically or or emotionally in some way you're making us feel cross because you're not involved in this in this touch uh relationship yeah it's completely fascinating um claire if it's right to take a step away from the detail of, of wrestling matches for a moment um and embrace mm. wrestling resurgence you just mentioned and i know i've said this to you privately but if it's right just a fanboy at you on camera um, <laughs> of course <laughs> it's, it's the most amazing project both um, research project and as a wrestling company uh it was so exciting to come and see the show back in back in March and it's wonderful seeing the work you're doing online and I guess I'd just like to ask you to invite you to tell us a bit more about about what it means to combine research and practice research and doing stuff in the form of a wrestling research project and a wrestling research company in which you also play the role as commentator yeah do you mind telling us a bit more about those various <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, that sounds as complicated as it probably is um, so um I, for me this whole kind of adventure with resurgence uh, started as an as an academic inquiry so it came out of um of a book that we co-edited co with Ira Lane and Broderick Chow called Performance of Professional Wrestling and I did a few kind of bits and pieces around the Leicester area where I was at the time uh, just little talks and things like that people like talking about wrestling 
They mm. just do. They find it intriguing, whether they like it or not. They find it intriguing, that, and they find it intriguing that I would be interested in wrestling. So, I um I gave little talks places, and after one of these talks, um, Sam West and John Kirby, who are two, uh, they were currently both working at Attenborough Arts Centre at the time. Um, came to me and said, "What well, you know, we, it would be great to do something with you about wrestling because we're also wrestling fans. And we, um, we then applied for a grant to the Being Human uh, Humanities Festival. And we said, we'd put on a wrestling show. And then lo and behold, if we didn't get the money for it, and then we had to put on a wrestling show. Uh, like, Does anyone know how to do this? And none of us did. So, um, so for <laughs> me at that particular moment, it was, I felt it really important because I really wanted to, um, connect this research with fans and I there's a kind of a strain I suppose of popular culture research which goes something like this like I am going to research you I am going to stand objectively away from you and I'm going to treat you like a experiment or something like that like a test tube like I'm going to try this thing out and then I'm going to apply my own so it's like you know the the notion of like well wrestling needs academia wrestling doesn't need academia it's perfectly happening its own thanks very much and i and i was really skeptical about those ways of approaching wrestling which seemed to be quite standoffish um and seemed to just kind of cast its own slightly objective slightly maybe slightly even snarky eye over wrestling and instead what i really really wanted to do was to connect the research with wrestling community and wrestling fans and wrestlers um in the acknowledgement that that was going to be a tricky thing to do because um, one has to develop relationships of trust and they take time and energy and um, and so I wasn't ever quite sure if we would ever be able to do it but then you know the, the guys from Resurgence that now what now is wrestling Resurgence at the time just started off as a can we put on a wrestling show for a night we did it um, we we got rid of all the tickets for free and people came Attenborough Arts Centre thought this was amazing they had an enormous bar bill which was uh, one of the highlights of the whole thing for them uh, and, um, and we were very interested in the way that putting wrestling in an art gallery made a difference to wrestling and made a difference to the art gallery so um, one of the one of the stats which has come out since then um, which which John our co-producer told me as I was trying to kind of come up with some of the stats around this project was that 80% of people who come to a wrestling resurgence show never have been inside Attenborough Arts Centre before. And in this period where we're really trying to work out how to encourage people into art centres, how to encourage people to engage with arts, how to not put people off arts, like it's kind, that is a kind of amazing stat. And I, I don't think, I, I think it's probably relatively unique, relatively unique, you know what I mean? Relatively unique. Um, to, to have a space which suddenly opens up to a bunch of people who would never go inside that space before. So that's, that's been very exciting. So from there, really, it, um, it kind of took off. We got given some other small grants from various places, including my home institution, Loughborough University, to, um, to do some more shows, some little films to go along with that, things like that. Um, and then um, Sam, as um, Sam West, an independent artist, won um, Arts Council funding. And then from there, Resurgence was able to kind of set itself up as an independent company, really. Um, and yeah, and so from, it's just sort of taken off from there. And now we work with some of the kind of best wrestlers in, in the world and some of the most generous and wonderful people. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, as you say, those connections take time. They take speaking each other's languages yes. um, and learning what each other's needs are. Um, I think you've done all that brilliantly and I, I guess for me you're describing a process of co-creation where people yes. are involved creating not just the the creative work the practical work but the research as well um, and I love the idea yeah. of yeah. the snarkification making it less yeah. getting rid of the snark because I think you're absolutely yeah. right about approaches to popular culture of, of all forms um, and again thinking about it kind of from from my position working in the 16th century it, it amazes me how often people theatre historians will imagine an audience member going to the playhouses, but there'll always be a remarkably 20, 20th century middle class audience member. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. <laughs> like, who is this person? <laughs> like, yeah, no, totally right. You get there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think the idea of co-creation has been absolutely central to what we've tried to do. And what, and what I've tried to do, even in my own research work, I've tr constantly tried to imagine it is being co-created. Co I, you know, I, I try to send it. To be, I think that sense of co-creation is just key to how wrestling functions anyway. Um, and therefore, in a sense, should be key to how wrestling scholarship 
functions as well i think um you know i mean this is what ha this is ha in entirely how we set up the original editor collection performance professional wrestling it was it was kind of a, a, a quite a peculiar book in lots of ways in that um chapters were four thousand words long maximum um because we wanted them to turn into kind of wrestling promos uh, so that they were actually reflecting and working with the mode that we were thinking about as opposed to let's write 10,000 word chapters where we like make sure that everyone uses like kind of critical theory for, just if they're useful use them great but if not like go with, go with these short chapters it means that fans can engage with them and you know the kind of language that we were using um, and, and fortunately, the publishers Routledge were were up for that because <laughs> uh, they could have just turned around and gone, no, this isn't anything like we we normally publish. But they didn't. They said, you know, with, with all great respect to them, they said, no, this is great. So, you know, just tr it's trying to make one scholarship connect with the world that one is looking at, as opposed to the outsider eye, which always felt so kind of awkward and odd to me. Mm. Yeah, and the outsider eye never actually learns very much, and certainly doesn't never learns anything except on its own terms. Yeah. Um, and isn't changed by the thing it's studying, and I think that's wonderful. That that edge of the collection is brilliant, by the way. I should make sure I oh, thank you. say that as well. Um, Claire, if it's all right to be nosy. You said when you first started building connections with wrestlers, you said that um, some people found your own identity intriguing. Now, do you mind if I ask? Is that on on the basis of? I mean, feel free not to answer this and tell me to go away. But um, <laughs> is that on the basis of your academic identity, is that on the basis of gender or of age or? Um, so I think it's probably a mixture of all of those things. I think I, I like telling people that I work on wrestling because normally people go, really? Like they're quite surprised. And I always try to pinpoint what it is that makes them surprised that I work on wrestling. I think firstly is that um, anybody would work on wrestling at all. And that that is a, <laughs> that is a source of surprise. Although saying that the world of professional wrestling scholarship has kind of um, become enormous over the past few years. So it's not as unusual as it was. I think the second thing was that I already had a sort of reputation by then for kind of fairly uh, kind of traditional, traditional-ish modernist work, which I still love. I, I love sitting in archives. I love sitting in libraries and researching. I, I, I love all that. I love theatre history. So, um, so I still do all those things, but I think that some t when I first told people I was going to do this, they were like, is that, is that not just kind of bit left field? Um, from what you normally do. So I think there was a kind of um, career, <laughs> a career question, let's say, you know, who gets a job by doing pro wrestling, uh, <laughs> by, by studying pro wrestling, which is an interesting question. Um, and I think then people were surprised because I'm a woman. There aren't that many women uh, at that point, particularly there weren't that many women studying pro wrestling at all. There are more now, but still predominantly it's guys. I don't necessarily fit into the demographic of a wrestling fan, I guess, as well. I don't know what that demographic is, really. I think it's very varied. But, you know, I, I, um, I'm not also a gamer, for example. And uh, I, I really like classical choral music and wrestling. And I've never, as I said at the start of this, I, I'm, a, I'm a natural generalist. So I'm just interested in the things I'm interested in. And I always have been interested. I like progressive rock music and I like wrestling. And I also really like uh, reading Victorian novels. And I think that that's fine. But I think that it kind of did, it made people go, oh, really? Um, and, and get quite confused about my identity, I guess, because I didn't necessarily fit into the, um, what they perceived to be a model of what a wrestling scholar might be. Yeah, that's fascinating. I love the idea of being an actual generalist and, and certainly in an academic context, there's so much pressure on us to define ourselves by a very specific and precise research interests, often at the expense of, I guess, the, the kind of positive word in our industry is, is, is scholarship, but mm -hmm. at, at the loss of that generalist, just willingness to be, you know, to go with the fact that you're interested by lots of things and that's okay, uh, yeah. and to allow that to lead you sometimes and to allow, ch you know, ch changes in the, in the world we're interested in to, to change us. I think yeah, right. I think that's very really important. I think um, so. I think this sense of sort of gem, a ge being a generalist has always been because I'm open. I, I hope anyway. I've been open to a range of different voices and opinions and ideas, and I'm kind of aware that every time I've started to think about something new, somebody said something or shared something, or I've learned something from maybe somewhere that I wasn't expecting to learn from, and that's influenced my own work. I mean, even my kind of more kind of scholarly work I guess has been deeply influenced by my day-to-day -day kind of practice based stuff with wrestling resurgence you know like I, I when I'm writing about 1930s wrestling I'm doing so 
in the knowledge that what comes later is this uh, amazing kind of experimental haptic uh, work that's coming later down the line. And, and a lot of that 1930s stuff for me has a much stronger resonance when I think about things like performed violence or when I think about anti-theatricality or, or any of those things because I'm working directly with wrestlers like on, on a regular basis. It's, it's, really, it's really, really important to the way that I think about the history of what I'm studying. Yeah, thank you. Um, and is, do you have a sense as to, I mean, you gave us a, a, a really full account of why the 1930s is suddenly a moment for, for the growth of wrestling, but um, is it also connected to, to media um, or is this still very much kind of live Live yeah, um, it's, it's still very much live experience, um, predominantly. So I think that there are a number of kind of old wrestling films, which are absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating and well worth a watch. Um, so, um, yeah, you go into British Pathé and just type in wrestling, some great stuff on there. So, like, you, you know, there, there is that, I think, a kind of a growth of wrestling with media, which is a kind of ongoing narrative around how wrestling has shifted and changed over the years. It's always been with, with the change in media. Um, so, you know, the, the growth in WWE, WWF at the time, was about television. It's about satellite TV. The growth in British professional independent wrestling now is about the growth in digital technology in that we you know resurgence has fans in brazil in the us you know in new zealand and we're like this is you know this is a small company in leicester and yet we're able to reach out to these people because of digital technology so um so i think it's always been really connected with media the 1930s stuff is still really live and one of the things i'm really fascinated in is the way that it connects with the communities there as well so like at that point it's still like a really working class culture um, and it's still kind of, and it's still now, um, seen as being kind of suspect. And I think wrestling's always suffered with this a little bit, that it's not seen as quite being um, suitable. <laughs> um, and this is, again, this is a recurring idea all the way through the history of wrestling. Um, it was in the 1930s. There's a, there's a you know, in, in this article that I, I recently published, um, I talk a lot about um, the government and the government's, the, there was the kind of debates in government about whether wrestling should be allowed or not, um, or whether it should be banned because it's too violent or because it's not, vi not, vi not actually violent. They couldn't quite decide which was worse, uh, <laughs> which again is one of the kind of key things about wrestling. Like, and this comes back again in like, you know, the 1980s, 1990s, when you have um, parental groups complaining to ab about wrestling being on television, uh, and, and th this is this is the ongoing thing thrown at wrestling is that somehow it is to the detriment of the people who are watching. Mm. So it kind of rots your brain in some way, mm. um, which, which I which I find fascinating. So behind that is a lot of snobbery and a lot of misjudging of uh, of the mode some right judging of the mode i hasten to add wrestling is not without its uh, troublesome history that we you know uh, we can't ignore that but i think that it, it often behind these um this sense that wrestling should be banned or somehow controlled is a sense of snobbery is a sense that we can't cope with these kind of unruly bodies uh and we we're, we're frightened of them in some way they're too they're they're too big they're too he they're too frightening they're too masculine they're too they're not feminine enough like these are just narratives that this kind of recur time and time again through the history of wrestling and i wonder if that the issue of the masculinity is also that it's so obviously performative mm -hmm. so it's both playing into issues of masculinity, but it's also kind of betraying and displaying um, the performativity of those gendered roles. And I also wonder if there's something about our culture and the culture of the 30s being very pro-language, but very anti-body language. Um, you know, language is intellect and anything else is not. Uh, doing good things to your brain, if there's something like, uh, around that going on. Oh, no, totally, yeah. I think there's that sense that, that you, it's, it's kind of anti-intellectual that it's, it's that it's dumb that it's that it's that it's kind of crass dumb stuff mm -hmm. uh, and i think there's there's still that sometimes you know that it happens rarely it happens less than it did but still occasionally i'll get you study wrestling isn't that that fake stuff um and when i started studying this it happened all the time and i sort of had stock answers for that particular accusation um 
and gradually it happens less, but it still happens. And I think there's still these assumptions made. Um, I think that the history of wrestling doesn't necessarily help with those assumptions. So you mentioned uh, Trump earlier on, and of course he has a background in wrestling, um, <laughs> a very strong background in wrestling. If your if your viewers are interested, if they if they go to YouTube and and look up Trump and wrestling and hair versus hair match, then you will to spend your afternoon watching uh, the now what leader of the free world maybe um kind of uh yeah shaving the head of vince mcmahon it's, um who's a, the head of wwe so he has a background in that re in wrestling and so there's this kind of tension i suppose that comes with um with studying wrestling oh isn't isn't that like really kind of right wing isn't that kind of homophobic isn't that um anti-women uh you know misogynistic like so and, and I, I can't deny that there is a history of that. Um, but I think the interesting thing, and we're, we're, um, so, so Ben Little and Tom Phillips and I have written a chapter recently for a new book coming out later in the year um, on populism and professional wrestling. And in that, we kind of make the claim that actually wrestling isn't inherently rightist or leftist. It's not inherently anything. It is what you play. It is the politics you place upon it. So, you know, our, our article for that is about progressive, um, progressive wrestling in Britain. My, my section in it is about veganism and British wrestling. So lots of British wrestling are vegans. Uh, wrestlers are vegans, which is fascinating. So there's, you can't make assumptions about this mode in a similar way that you can't about theatre. You can't say all theatre is this. And I think that's one of the things that I'm trying to shift and get away from in my own scholarship is the assumption that wrestling is like this because it was like that at one point or is like this because of this particular match or this particular angle or whatever it might be. Um, actually, that's, that's placing content on a form that isn't inherently anything. It's, it's you know, it, 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 has, it has openings for a range of different ways of approaching it, I guess. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and I, I don't want to propose we talk about Trump anymore, but I am now <laughs> thinking about reading his, his entire career and particularly his career at the moment in terms of, he, of being a heel wrestler. Yes. Um, because quite a lot of his Twitter performativity actually feels very much like deliberate targeted audience baiting. Oh um, yeah. There's a lot of fascinating stuff written about this. So in this book that I'm, I've mentioned that's coming out later this year, a, a number of the article, a number of the chapters are around this. Mm. Um, there's, um, when, when Trump first got into power, I did a lot of TV work. Uh, because everyone wanted to know more about Trump and wrestling. So I did a lot of stuff about like, well, he uses his hands a lot. And there's this hair thing. The hair thing is fascinating. So like the power through the hair, yeah. you know, like people mocked his hair. Yes, but actually it was a sign of virility. Well, he thought it was a sign of virility and his fans thought it was a sign of virility. And when you read it back through that hair versus hair match where the loser basically was going to have his head, head shaved, um, it has a whole new way of reading all that. And the way, you know, the, the language he uses about his opponents, you know, crooked Hillary, like these are wrestling terms. This is all wrestling terms. So I think you can understand a lot of contempt. You know, people often say you can understand politics as a kind of theatrical uh, trope. I think that's true, but I think you can push it further and understand it as a kind of um, excessive theatricality in some ways, which was where it connects with wrestling, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, <laughs> and I guess the last thing I'm thinking about in relation to the kind of long history you've given us of 20th and 20, early 20th century wrestling and what it, how it, the things it might mean to people, I guess I'm thinking also about um, what I guess wrestling, wrestlers would call gear um, and theatre people would call costume and mm -hmm. also the, 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 what is usually a lack of costume, you know, the rel relatively overt levels of um, nudity is the wrong word, but it's putting it too strongly, but um, the yes. amount of body display, um, mm -hmm. think about how that reads um, across the 20th century and the early 21st century and again how that reads in terms of masculinity, in terms of both homophobia but also for the potential queerness of wrestling, how it reads yeah. Um, for female audience members and female wrestlers. Um, yeah, there's something there about body presentation, clothing, etc. Absolutely. So in that, the 1930s context that I'm telling you about, there was a particular moment where um, a promoter, wrestling promoter, uh, went to the local council because they had said, you know, we're, we're not having this. This is, I think it was, I think it was Hull at the time, though I could be wrong, but the, the article talks more about it. But it says, we're not having wrestling because it's um, unsavory. 
actually and it's um and and we don't like the way that women so he was promoting a women's match so this is again counters that notion that women's wrestling is somehow new and modern it's really not at all like uh, there was a lot there's been a lot of women's wrestling for good or ill i hasten to add right the way through the 20th century 20th century and um and he, his comment back was that they are more clothed than music hall dancers so you want to ban music hall now? And that was his argument. And I, I've always kind of been struck by that because, um, you know, what, what he was trying, what the promoter was trying to do was to say, you know, your established theatre, I mean, it's music hall, so it's kind of you know, unestablished theatre. I mean, it's popular culture, isn't it? But you know your thing that you wouldn't really think about banning. Well, actually, I'm, I'm putting more clothes on my wrestlers than you are, than you are in that. So should we ban... So, I think what I'm, what I'm saying there is that wrestling often makes us reflect on other forms of popular culture and, um, and, and those bodies, for example. So, and that happens right the way through, right up to present day. So if I see, um, if I, if I, and this happens now all the time because a lot of the wrestlers are in the movies. So I go, oh, John Cena, <laughs> he's, like a, he's like a superhero. And then he actually is a superhero. <laughs> so like there's, there's the, the bodies, I think, um, is, a, is a really, really interesting uh, it's a really interesting element of wrestling. And I think the way that we read those bodies is, is fascinating and allows us to think in deeper ways about a whole range of things and to make these sort of intertextual connections. I think those intertextual connections yeah. often occur in the body of the wrestler. I only have to watch like, you know, those ridiculous Fast and Furious films with The Rock. Like he does wrestling moves all the time in those films, like all the time. I know if I was a wrestling fan, I'm like, I totally know what you're doing there. That's like a rock mm -hmm. bottom. That's interesting. Um, but if you're just watching the film, then it's a different thing. But I'm reading, I'm reading the body in a, in a really kind of different way. So it allows us to think, uh, yeah, to, to think, to think in more connected ways about popular culture, I think. Yeah, that's nice. And the, the, the 1930s promoter making analogy to music halls is, is also sort of making a concession there in terms of where wrestling sits in his own head, I presume, in that he's linking it to another art form, which is about using the human body to excite audiences. Yeah, uh, totally. And, you know, the history of wrestling is tied up with that music hall variety theatre thing. So late, late 19th century, really, when professional wrestling first appeared, it was all in variety theatres and it was in circuses. You know, Barnum had um wrestlers had like strong men like this is these are these are tropes that appear right the way through kind of popular that that early popular culture stuff and you find the figure of the wrestler or the kind of performing um the performing fighter that says i'll take on any comer that sort of character it might not be necessarily a wrestler per se but that sort of performing character recurs time and time and time again, right the way through the history of the 20th century, and, and, and particularly in the music hall, where you would have these wrestlers kind of come on, do these kind of amazing feats of strength, um, like wrestle a bear. There was a lot of that went on at the time. Um, going back to your, your animals project, uh, there's a lot of that sort of wrestling bears. Um, and, um, and, you know, right, you know that, that's the kind of, again, a kind of a regular moment that comes back time and time again, wrestling in, in wrestling history, I think. Yeah, thank you, Claire. And we should we should move to wrap up now. Uh, and I feel like because you keep putting us back to the early early history of this, I feel like we should do a plug for forthcoming work for the box office Bears project um, and the um, Rough Play with Shakespeare event that you and I were involved with um, or cancelled for COVID. But we will be bringing that to a bit lit and thinking about an even an even longer history because again, um, um, the theatres of Shakespeare's time are also combat venues, hosting forms of of, of hand uh, hands on fencing, essentially wrestling, but with all but also with swords. Um, and the female fighting tradition is, is alive and well in the 16th century too and, and physical displays of strength. Um, so I think there's some really exciting long histories which hopefully we'll start to tell together. Yeah, I'm very excited, definitely. And I think that sense of like women's wrestling, women's fighting, I'm very, very interested in because I think so often it can be presented as, and this is what often happens, like it's presented as, oh, this is a contemporary, you know, finally women can wrestle. It's like, not finally women can wrestle. Women have always been wrestling. It's just that it's, a, it's in a sense a lost history, which, yeah. which people don't know. And therefore they watch contemporary wrestling and go, finally, feminism comes to wrestling. It's like, like it's, it's, it's always been there. It's just that you've been taken in by kind of, patriarchal narratives really around wrestling where you know when I, I, and so when you see that you imagine that all wrestling is like that but in, it's in 1930s going back to your own field like that there are there are lots of examples of of women strongman women fighters women wrestlers um who 
are very kind of really quite subversive about the body and about their own gender and about their own place in, in society, which is totally fascinating to me. Yeah, and me too. Yeah, I look forward to more conversations. Claire, yeah. this has been completely fascinating and wonderful. Um, thank you very much. I am particularly excited about taking on snarky scholarship. That always makes me happy. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for your time. Oh, it's a pleasure, not at all. Take care.